In today's passage walkthrough, I'm going to show you how the MCAT will test a little bit of physics in the biology and biochemistry section because they know how we can't get enough of that subject. Let's go ahead and look at the AMC sample test biology and biochemistry section passage number seven. It says, normal color vision in humans is trichromatic, requiring three visual pigments that individually absorb either green, red, or blue light. Color blindness has a variety of genetic causes. Okay, so they, they introduce kind of what vision is, which is the absorption of pigments. So we're going to absorb pigments and then they immediately pivoted to color blindness saying it's due to a, a lot of different genetics genetic causes so I'm gonna put down genetics because it seems like we're about to go down that rabbit hole some colorblind individuals have a reduced amount of one of the visual pigments and cannot distinguish as many hues as individuals with normal vision can so on our flow chart we can say color blindness is due to decreased pigments other individuals have a complete lack of one visual pigment and can therefore only absorb light of two colors. So remember they said that our vision is trichromatic meaning that it involves three colors and some people actually lose one of those colors so now we're just dealing with only two colors and the different shades between those two. Red or green color deficiency is a sex linked trait affecting 8% of Caucasian males. Um, so under genetics because it said sex linked I'm gonna go ahead and put we've got a red green and it is due to sex linked or it's it's an X linked gene which is the same thing as sex linked. Blue defects are relatively rare and they are autosomal traits. So remember blue defects are relatively rare and they are autosomal traits. So remember there are two ways to inherit traits. So we can do it through sex links or we can have autosomal inheritance. The sex links are whenever the gene is attached to the X or the Y chromosome. And the autosomal traits are whenever we're somewhere on one of the other 23 chromosomes. So we have this blue color deficiency and that is an autosomal trait. That's what most of your traits are going to end up being. If we keep reading it says separate but closely linked genes on the X chromosome encode for the production of red and green pigments. The genes for these two pigments are thought to have arisen by duplication of a segment of the chromosome followed by DNA mutations. Okay, so the important thing there is that this is going to be involving linkage. Remember, linkage is that thing that kind of busted up Mendelian's P experiment. It's the idea that two genes, if they're close enough on a chromosome, can actually impact the inheritance cycle of each other. Okay, so if we keep reading, it says four alleles are recognized for each pigment. So red, green, Green and blue each have four alleles. The allele for normal vision is plus. And it's dominant over color weakness, which is one apostrophe, and which is dominant over the allele for extreme color weakness, which is two, which is dominant over the allele for the lack of pigments. So it seems like progressively we want to retain pigment. The retention of pigment seems to be dominant. Most defective alleles arise from unequal combination, resulting in deletion or combination with partial chromosome loss of the genes for red and green pigment. So there's a whole lot going on there. There's a whole lot that I could write down, but I don't don't think it's a great usage of my time to go through and for example write out what each of the pluses and the apostrophes and the dashes mean whenever I know kind of exactly where it is in the passage. So going on, it says seven genotypes and their corresponding phenotypes for inheritance of red green color vision have been identified in Caucasian males. So it's just kind of giving me a description of what table one is. Remember, um, when we're interpreting figures, we pretty much read this distribution of types of inheritance. So this is just kind of giving us a little bit of a picture as to the frequency um, what the genotype looks like and how that ends up playing in the phenotype for ca Caucasian males. I'm not going to worry about interpreting all of this because I don't know what the heck it means. Um, and I, may, I might not even get asked a question on it. So I'm going to go ahead and skip to the questions. So you'll notice that that's a relatively short passage. And that means get ready for the questions. They're about to be gassed up. But let's see. Question number 36 says, when fewer visual pigment molecules are available to absorb light, for example, when a person has a color weakness, which of the following nervous system responses occurs? So they're essentially just asking us how does light absorption work and how does the pigment absorption translate to the nervous system? And if we were to inhibit that or to weaken that, what would that look like? So A says fewer signals of the weakly perceived color are sent to the brain. Well, we know that the way that absorption works is that light hits the pigment and then the pigment is like, okay, I just got touched by a wavelength that I like, and it's gonna go ahead and send a nerve impulse. But if it doesn't realize that it's getting that wavelength very often, it's gonna send fewer of these impulses. So I like answer choice A, because the other pigments are not going to be able to detect that wavelength. So maybe to A, B says a normal number of signals of the weakly perceived color is sent to the brain, but each signal is less intense. 
Uh, so this is wrong for a couple of reasons. One is that it's kind of assuming that the weekly perceived color is a function of the actual incoming light. And that's not true. It's a function of the pigment absorbing cells in the retina. So it's, it's false there for one reason. But the second reason is it's saying that each signal is going to be less intense. And remember, these are action potentials. And a huge characteristic of action potentials is that they are all or nothing. So how do action potentials encode strength? Because when I look at certain hues of red, it's going to look different than when I look at lighter hues of red. Well, they do that with frequency, right? Not intensity. And so B is going to end up being incorrect for multiple reasons. So we'll kind of rule that one out. C says the signals for the weekly perceived color are sent to the brain via other more plentiful pigments. C is assuming that just because we have one pigment that kind of isn't going to participate very much that the other pigments will pick up the slack and just send signals for their pigment. But that's not the way that it worked because each pigment is going to absorb a specific wavelength. So for example, let's say we have a red, green, and blue pigment. If we have a wavelength coming in around 700 nanometers, it is only going to be absorbed by this red pigment. Is it going to hit the other pigments? Yeah, they're like right next to each other. But it's not go they're not going to absorb it. So we can cross that out. So maybe not to answer choice C, because each pigment is specific for a specific range of wavelengths. D says light molecules stimulate the cells to make additional pigment. Well, if that's the case, then colorblindness would not be an issue. Um, if light told us to make more pigment, well, then we wouldn't have a deficiency in pigment to begin with. So that's just not the way that the biology works. So you can rule that out, and then you're only left with answer choice A. Number 37 says, based on the information in the graph below, which of the following statements best describes the color perception of a person with a phenotype, quote, red pigment absent? And then they give us this graph. Okay, let's go ahead and orient ourselves to this graph just because I feel like we're going to have to use it. It's included in the actual question stem. So it looks like we've got three peaks. And I would assume that those peaks are going to be correlated to red, green, and blue pigment. Don't get the color of my pen confused with the specific pigment. Actually, I'll change it. The question stem is telling us that we're going to remove the red pigment, which is going to be this curve. And then they're going to say, what is this person's visual perception going to be like? Well, they're going to have a complete deficit in anything to the right of this line because it doesn't have any overlap from other pigments. And then more than likely, the colors in this overlapping area will look a lot more like the pigment that is still present, which is going to be the green pigment. So answer choice a says red colors appear more green than normal. Well, that makes sense because a red color would be coming around this wavelength. And so if you don't have a red pigment to absorb that, you're still going to have some of this overlap from the green pigment that's going to pick up some of the hues of red. And so those hues of red are going to look more green. So I like answer choice A, and it's just classical red pigment colorblind. So maybe to A. B says green colors appear more red than normal. That doesn't make sense because you don't have red pigment. C says both red and green colors appear more blue than normal. It tells us that we're only missing the red pigment, not the green pigment. So it doesn't make sense that green colors would be affected too. So maybe not to C. And then D says neither red nor green colors are perceived. Again, it tells us that only red pigment is absent. Now I know a lot of you are probably confused because you're thinking... Oh, well, red and green are linked. They did that to throw you off their trail. It's true, they are linked, but here they're telling us specifically that red pigment is the one that's absent. So don't make any assumptions past what they're telling you. So that leads me to ruling out answer choice D as well, and then A would be correct. Number 38 says a mother and a father with normal color vision have a son who is colorblind with green pigment absent. So here they're telling us what they're missing is green pigment. What genotype did the mother most likely have? So you've kind of got to read into this question a good bit to see what they're really telling you. We know that green pigment absence is a sex-linked trait, but we don't know whether it's X or Y, or at least that's not given to us in the passage. So you kind of have to read into this question a little bit for it to make sense. But remember that they told us in the second paragraph that this was an X-linked disease. And so that means that mom is going to have to pass on that green pigment absent, but she must have at least one healthy chromosome 
that's dominant over that green pigment absent. So what we're looking for is something that's going to have G plus and a G minus. Now as far as the R's go, our question stem does not tell us that this patient is experiencing red color blindness as well. So we're going to assume that this patient is completely healthy and has two plus signs. Going through these answer choices, A says the mother is heterozygous for both. Probably not because she didn't pass on the R gene, although I do think that A could be considered a correct answer choice as well. It's just less likely because the positive allele is dominant. So maybe to A, we'll leave it in because it, it technically could be correct. B says color weakness in all of them. No, we don't have color weakness. We have complete absence, which is denoted by that minus sign, remember? C says exactly what we were looking for. So I like C. And then D says color weakness in green and red followed up with complete presence of color pigment in green and red, which we're going to rule out because, again, we were looking for absence. So maybe not to D. And that leaves us between A and C. The most likely of those answer choices would end up being answer choice C. Now, this would be a question that in medical school you could challenge and you could go to the professor and depending on the type of mood that he or she were in, they would probably give you credit for answer choice A and answer choice C because it's still within the realm of possibility. But the most likely answer choice is going to be C because it ensures that we would still have the presence of red pigment. So it's the safest answer choice. And remember, you're picking the best answer choice, not the only true answer choice when it comes to the MCAT. And there's an important distinction. This last one says the genes for red-green color blindness will affect production of proteins in which are the following types of cells. They're just saying, where does this pigment lie? A says in the neurons of the visual center of the brain. No, the pigment's not in the neurons, right? The pigment's in the retinal cells, so maybe not to A. B says neurons making up the optic nerve. Now remember, we have to have the pigment to transmit the impulse to our neurons, so I'll say maybe not to B. C says the pigment cells of the iris. This is a pretty attractive answer choice just because we can visually picture the pigment cells in an individual's iris, but those are actually not the pigment cells that are absorbing color. So when you look at my eyes and I have brown eyes, or you look at Maggie's eyes and she has blue eyes, that's not the pigment cells that are actually absorbing color. So even though there are pigment in those cells, those are not the ones that are absorbing color. The pigment cells that are absorbing color are on the retina, so maybe not C. And then D says the visual receptor cells in the retina. That's the correct answer choice. And the way that this chain actually looks for you to make notes on is if you consider this eye with the sun and light coming through, it's going to pierce through the pupil, which is surrounded by the iris, and it's going to hit our retina here. The retinal cells are then going to relay that transmission through the optic nerve to the optic centers of the brain. So that's not a pathway you're going to get tested on a ton, but it's noticeable and it's handy to have in your back pocket for questions like this. So you see now how they like to test a little bit of the physics by bringing in wavelengths and different things like that. Um, but you'll notice that on the CP section, they test your physics and your understanding of wavelengths with math. Whereas in the BB section, like today, they tested it more under the conceptual understanding of what pigmentation means and how we absorb light. If you're curious about the strategies that I use today to dissect the passage or to understand and answer the questions correctly, make sure to check out our strategies playlist. It's great for people that haven't seen it, but it's also really useful to view those videos a few times as you're studying to make sure that you're keeping up with best practices and locking down that high MCAT score. Thanks for watching the video, and I will see you in the next one.